So the reading this evening is Revelation chapter 13. The dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads, with ten crowns on its horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. People worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast. And they also worshipped the beast and asked, Who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise its authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. It was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them, and it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. Whoever has ears, let them hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity they will go. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword they will be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. Then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. It exercised all the authority of the first beast on its behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. And it performed great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people. Because of the signs it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast, it deceived the, the inhabitants of the earth. It ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. The second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. It also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads, so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man. That number is 666. I think we need to pray, don't you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, please help us now to be guided by your words. May it be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Um, help me as I explain it. Help all of us as we listen. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let me start by asking you a slightly spooky question. If the devil had a plan to attack you, what do you think his plan would look like? If the devil had a plan to attack you, what would his plan look like? That might sound like a, a whimsical question to non-Christian ears. But as a thought experiment, I wonder what you think. If the devil had a plan to attack you, what would his plan actually look like? 
Perhaps your mind goes to the stuff of horror movies. Blood trickling down the walls, evil clowns, jump scares, that kind of thing. Priests getting beaten up. Is that what Satan's schemes looked like? Would his schemes look like the blatant Satanism of the occult, complete with pentangles and seances and so on? Would it come from those modern witchcraft books you can get down at the shops or in the Halloween decorations on the high street? That's what folk might tend to think of immediately when we picture the devil and his work. Is that where we would find the main prong of his attack? Or is that stuff actually quite obvious and quite easy to spot a mile off? What else might his attacks against us look like? Might there be something a little closer to home, a little more normal, that is actually hiding in plain sight that Satan uses against us? Could it be the devil has schemes we need to be on guard against in the ordinary world? And below the surface, in the world we inhabit, could there be battle fronts in the war he is fighting against God. As ever, Revelation's purpose tonight is to whip that sheet off the statue to reveal what is there and show us what is really going on in this world. And tonight we're going to see Satan's schemes unmasked. A garish passage with its beasts and numbers so on. It's a cartoon for us of the reality of our present world, which is the same reality as the world of John's readers back in the first century. And it's a world where Satan is at work waging war. Last time we saw that, when we looked at chapter 12, we saw a spiritual war underway between a dragon and God. We saw we're in a series of visions in chapters 12 to um, 14 slash 15 here in Revelation. And like the previous sections, this is an overlapping vision of the present age and the return of Jesus. It overlaps with the other visions. So this beast stuff is not some far future event exclusively in the year 3000. It's a picture of John's reader's world and our world. And we know that especially because John's put application in for his readers, hasn't he? In verse 10 at the end, he says this calls for perseverance, patience, endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. And he's put verse 18 as well. There's the application. This calls for wisdom. That's what the passage calls for. And what we've seen so far in these visions is that we've seen a war zone. There is a war going on in this universe. A war between Satan and God. And a conflict that will define history and define all our lives, depending on which side we're on. And last time, we actually saw it's already been won. We saw the decisive engagement that Satan was hurled down from heaven. There, in chapter 12, verse 10, the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb. Because of the first coming of Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross, we can have victory against Satan. But it also showed us at the end of 12 that he's going down fighting. Last verse of chapter 12. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's commands and hold fast to the testimony of Jesus. So this is what's going on. There's a war on. The dragon's been defeated, but the dragon is going down fighting and he is attacking the people God saves and in chapter 13 now we see how he does that in two ways through two agents as it were the beast from the sea one to ten and then the beast from the earth 11 to 18 both of which end with a response this calls for wisdom or this calls for perseverance so let's look at them both First of all, the beast out of the sea. If you look at 13 verse 1, what's going on here with the imagery? The dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. 
It had ten horns and seven heads with ten crowns on its head, and on each had a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had the feet of those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. What's all that symbolism mean? Well, if you were here last week, you might remember I was waving around a big yellow book uh, called Revelation, a shorter commentary, which was actually quite big. And I made the point that that had helped me see how a lot of these images are straight from the Old Testament. And I want you to turn to Daniel 7, please. Because I think that will help enormously. This is one of the most important passages to know in the Old Testament for understanding Jesus. It's where his title, Son of Man, comes from, which he uses for himself. And it really helps us with the beasts. Because if you can turn to Revelation, uh, Daniel 7, sorry, Daniel has a vision. And in verse 2, it says this. Daniel said, in my vision at night, I looked and there before me were the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. The first was like a lion and it had the wings of an eagle. Skip down to verse 5. And then before me was a second beast which looked like a bear. Skip down to verse 6. And then I looked, and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard. Skip down to verse 7. And then in my vision at night I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. And then... Jesus comes. Verse 13. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And if you cast an eye down to 17, we're told what the beasts are. The four great beasts are four kings that will rise from the earth. And later on, verse 23, the fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on the earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms. Now that's incredibly helpful, isn't it? Because if we come back to Daniel, uh, Revelation 13, all of a sudden, our eyes should be lighting up because we think, oh, the beast from the sea. Well, that's Daniel's first beast. Beast with ten horns. That's Daniel's fourth beast. Then it's a lion and a bear and a leopard. That's a, a mashup. This is a combination of all Daniel's beasts squidged into one. And we know what it represents because just as in Daniel, the beast represents kings or kingdoms. That is what this beast represents as well. That's what the imagery signifies. It signifies the powers that be. Human government, the state, empire, political power. In Revelation 13, you can see that in verse 2 as well, because at the end, the dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and his great authority. And there was a little bit at the start of Revelation where John was, oh, Jesus was speaking to one of the seven churches and said, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. So John sees this throne of Satan, which apparently the beast occupies, as where they live. This is the political powers that be. This is the system which exercises authority over this world. And John's point is, this beast is satanic and oppressive. If you're wondering what all the symbolism of the crowns and stuff is about, well, we know that horns are about power and crowns are about authority, at least. You might be feeling a little bit of deja vu from last week because didn't the dragon have multiple heads and horns? Funnily enough, if you compare them, dragon had seven heads, ten horns, seven crowns. Beast is almost identical. It's 
uh, seven heads, ten horns, but then even more crowns. Ten crowns, and ten symbolizing multiplicity, and seven symbolizing completion, so complete power or pretensions to complete power. And this beast looks like Satan. It's in the image of Satan. It resembles Satan. It has a satanic character, we could say. It's not just on its team. It's like him. Chapter 17 will give a bit more detail on what all the horns mean. But for now, I want to focus on the beast's relationship to Satan. Where does he get his power? Verse 2, the dragon gave the beast this power. He gets his authority from Satan. In John's world and in our world, there is human authority in place, which, spiritually speaking, is in the pay of Satan. That sounds crazy. That sounds bonkers and crackpot. The idea that bumbling human governments in grey office buildings could be serving the purpose of Satan. But John says, peer behind the curtain. And that is actually what's going on. In the age of the church, not every politician, but human political power, the powers that be in general, are used by Satan. This is a fascinating point as well. The text shows us that if you look at the relationship between Satan and the beast, they're a fake copy of the father and the son. They copy Jesus and his father in so many ways. Verse 1, the beast has crowns. Jesus will turn up later with many crowns. The beast has blasphemous names written on it. Jesus will turn up with his name written on them later. And we could go on. Verse 2, the beast is given Satan's throne. Jesus has sat down on his father's throne and received authority and power from him. Verse 3, the beast seems to have suffered some kind of death and resurrection. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have a fatal wound, literally a slain or slaughtered wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. Jesus is the lamb who was slain, who once was dead, but now he lives. The beast is parodying that, is imitating that. It appears to have victory over a death. It's been knocked down, but it's got up again. It's alive. It's like Jesus. It's a fake Jesus. Verse 3 in the second half, the whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. People worshipped the dragon because it had given authority to the beast and they also worshipped the beast. And that dual worship, worshipping beast and dragon, it's like the worship of the father and the son to the one who sits on the throne and to the lamb. Be praise and honour and glory, Revelation says. This is a fake trinity. They receive international worship, don't they? All peoples of tribes and nations are worshipping them. Well, that's the Son of Man in Daniel, isn't it? That's what Jesus gets. The beast and his dark father, Satan, are an imitation of God. And the same in verse 4, in the questions they ask. Who is like the beast? Who is like you among the gods, O Lord? That's what the people at the Exodus sang by the Red Sea when God saved them. Who is like you? You are incomparable. And now the beast is being viewed of as divine, a divine saviour, a Jesus-like victor over death. This is a fake Jesus and a fake trinity. And the thing about Satan is he's not original he doesn't have many ideas of his own. He can only copy and counterfeit. And what this is showing is that human government, the powers that be in the church age, these 42 months, which are three and a half years, representing the, the limited time of the church's suffering witness, human government has a spiritual character. The state will act as if it is God. Kings will act as if they are God. The powers that be will present themselves as saviours and require not just Christian obedience, 
which is appropriate, but idolatrous worship from their people. And that is the work of the devil. Back in John's day, his readers would have no problem recognizing a manifestation of the beast, would they? They'd look and they'd think, oh, it's, it's the Roman Empire, where emperors are turned into gods after they die, where the cult of the goddess Roma and all the pagan gods are promoted. Some folk tie this passage to a very specific period in church history, like maybe the persecution of Domitian, um, who persecuted Christians, or it's easy to think of Nero and the great fire of Rome and the Christians he killed, including Peter and Paul, when we read verse 6. And it says it opened its mouth to blaspheme God and slander his name in his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. It was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. To conquer them. It's probably not true that all of John's readers were facing persecution because the seven churches sound like some of them are, well, they might be getting on very well with their government. They've got another set of problems. Some of them are, some of them aren't. But either way, John's showing them what might Satan's schemes against them look like, what is his plan of attack, what is lurking behind the curtain of state power, the beast. Expect attacks to come from human government. Satan will use it to wage war. He will use those in positions of power to oppress God's people and he will try to replicate God as an object of worship. <clears throat> Verse 8, all inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. Do you recognize the beast? You see it happening really obviously in blatant, tyrannical governments, like some of the totalitarian governments in places like North Korea, don't you? Where you have to worship the great leader and Christian dissidents are carted off to labor camps to die. You see it in the Hitlers and the Stalins and the Pol Pots, killing the Bonhoeffers, building cultish followings and personality cults as the great dictators. You also see the beast through the benign bureaucracy of less obviously oppressive governments. But just think about how in the last few years, for instance, we've been encouraged to think about the NHS as a savior. Not just a good thing, a God thing. Something that saves us from death. That we must applaud and give to, and God forbid if we criticize it, it's almost become an object of worship. When governments and kings present themselves as saviors, giving us victory over death, unstoppable, unbeatable, something's going on. Think of the stories and narratives that nations tell themselves. Rome's story about bringing Roman peace to the world, through warring down the proud. Think about America leading the free world, a savior narrative. The French Republic stands for liberty, equality, fraternity, a savior narrative. The Soviet Union said workers of the world unite, a savior narrative. Now we're getting a lot about building back better in more than one country. That's a savior narrative, isn't it? Save the planet. Dig into those things. You will find encouragements to put your trust in humans and human power to save you from something. To rely on it as you would on God. And that's idolatry. And where it's not for, where our worship is not forthcoming, states can and will get nasty. And that's true in democratic states as much as autocratic ones. When the police arrest street preachers in London, for instance, for stating Bible truths. 
when the Scottish government puts up posters saying, dear bigots, we don't want your religious hate on our buses or streets and our communities. Thank you very much. When Christian faith is excluded from the public square and when lower down the food chain, bosses in charge of workplaces and universities and schools decide to act against staff who act on their Christian beliefs. What's going on? When a school chaplain recently was reported to prevent the counter-terrorism organization because he gave a talk to children saying you don't have to agree with the LGBT agenda. What is going on there? Has the world gone mad? No, the devil is, is waging war through the beast. He wants to make it as hard as possible for you to follow Jesus and as scary as possible, and so he will use the powers that be to do that. And he doesn't just use oppression. Point two, verse 11 we see he uses other tactics with the second beast, the beast from the earth. Verse 11, then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. So this is the third member of the unholy trinity. There is a second beast Satan uses, and once again we see its relationship to Satan is really close because verse 11, it speaks like a dragon. Verse 12, it exercised all the authority of the first beast on its behalf and made the earth and the inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. He seems all about encouraging the worship of the beast. He's a worship leader. But what's different? Well, firstly, he comes from the earth. I'm not entirely sure why. Um, could be picking up on Behemoth and Leviathan in Job, a monster from the land and the sea. Could be picking up on that. But there's a startling difference with the first beast. The first beast was visibly terrifying. This one, on the other hand, it had two horns like a lamb. Oh, well, that's not too bad. Could be, oh, it's got two hand, uh, horns. It's, per it's a perfectly ordinary lamb two might be connected to the witness idea that we've seen before but I'm not 100% sure on that but either way he looks like a lamb and who's a lamb in Revelation he looks like Jesus he looks like Jesus for Jesus is a lamb but verse 11 it spoke like a dragon what it says is of the devil. And what we can see from its role is that it's, well, it's a worship leader, a worship enforcer. We see that later, don't we? And it's a prophet. Verse 13, it performed great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people. That's an Elijah thing, isn't it? It's an Elijah miracle. It's a prophet miracle. Just like the church was given a prophetic role back in 11, and that was pictured as fire from heaven. This is a prophet. This is a cartoon of prophetic ministry. The beast is there to convince people to worship the second beast. He's the, the, the PR campaign. Verse 14, because of the signs it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast, it deceived the inhabitants of the earth. Key word, it is a deceiver. It persuades people. And it's an enforcer of religion. It ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded. This is like um, Nebuchadnezzar, isn't it? The second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast, so that the image could speak and cause all who refused the worship of the image to be killed. This is like the kings in the Old Testament who force people to worship their images. And the beast is very successful. It seems to be able to do signs, to convince people. It seems to be able to make its image look alive. It's very convincing. 
In the words of the rest of Revelation, this is called the false prophet. It's going to be called the false prophet in a couple of chapters' time. You get the dragon, you get the beast, meaning the main beast, and you get the false prophet, because that's its job. It stands for false religion and attempts to persuade people, to coerce people, to deceive people into false religion. Just like the Holy Spirit's work is to point people to the Lord Jesus and the worship of him, so this creature's work is to point people to the unholy trinity and get people to worship Satan and his surrogate. In John's day, this might include the priests and propagandists of the imperial cult and festivals for the Roman gods. It might be false teachers within the church. Remember, it looks like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. Step into many Christian contexts, Christian organizations today, you will find the appearance of Christianity. You will find the outfits and you will find religious arts and forms of Christian corporate worship which seem very Christian. It looks like the real thing. But in a great many of them, when you listen to what is being said and what is being encouraged, whose voice are you hearing? Verse 1 looks like a lamb but it spoke like a dragon i remember going to a church a few years ago it was a lovely christmasy service it looked so lovely and churchy and christmasy sermon was clear heresy i don't enjoy saying that because i don't like to um, encourage a judgmental character but it was it was clearly opposed to the gospel because it was encouraging people not to trust in Jesus, but say, oh, there are many ways. So what's the point of Jesus? What's the point of believing in Jesus if there are many, many good ways? That was the voice of the dragon. It denies the truth. And sometimes heretics are wildly successful. Verse 14, the beast can do signs. It can impress people. It's an impressive false prophet. That's why it's successful. And it will encourage the cult of the first beast. Where faith in God and true worship are undermined, false faith, false worship will spring up. And that's why the beast is a worship leader. Get rid of God and the next most powerful thing will probably take its place. And that will probably be the rulers. You might have heard of branches of the church which have turned into government propaganda machines in the past, like Hitler's German Christian movement, which separated from the confessing church in 1934. Look them up online. Their flag has the cross and the swastika together on the same flag. Do we see that mix today, that mix of politics and the gospel, or rather, because the gospel does speak, and the Bible does speak into the public square, do we see churches selling out their vision in service of the state, the government, or the powers that be, or a political vision? Colin mentioned earlier uh, Bishop Michael Nazirali, former Anglican who became a Catholic recently, which I still don't quite understand. Um, but he's written an article where he says one of the reasons is people are letting go of the gospel and are just turning to an entirely political agenda. He's saying the church councils and synods are permeated by activists who each have a single issue, often faddish agenda, whether it's about cultural correctness, climate change, etc. All sorts of things. When you have got churches becoming nothing more then mouthpieces for state policy, especially policies which either go against the Bible or put human government, human power as the savior. What's going on? Well, we've got beast number two. We have the false prophet. Think very carefully about the church's relationship with the state. One weird thing you get in some American churches is some of them have an American flag in them. Do you like that? Well, I 
do you feel about that? We mustn't worship the state. We must not give to human power what is due to God alone in terms of worship and trust and our highest loyalty. Because God's kingdom is international and his people are marked by him, not by the beast. Very quickly, um, you probably know some people get very excited about what is going on with the 666 stuff. Um, Old Testament image, uh, Ezekiel. God marks his people on their heads. And in chapter 14, we'll see God's people with his name on their heads. And Satan copies that again by marking his people. Uh, again, this is a cartoon. So just as Christians don't have facial tattoos, otherwise or we should all go down to the tattoo parlor and get God's name on our heads. Uh, so I don't think it's literally 666 on our heads. Um, it's symbolism. I don't think it's a barcode or something like that. It's something that is recognizable in John's day and in our day, which is pressure and persecution and discrimination against the people of God for their worship of him and their refusal to worship the beast. Maybe you get social stigma in John's day for refusing to sacrifice to the emperor. Maybe you get that in our time for visibly refusing to sign up to the world's agenda. What does 666 mean? Is it some clever code? Um, do you add up all the numbers in the, in the, in, or add up all the letters in the, someone's name and they add up to 666 and it ends up as Nero Caesar or Donald Trump or something? No, I don't think so. I think it's a symbolism. Um, seven, number of completion or perfection. Six, falling short of that. It's falling short of perfection. And it comes three times because God isn't just holy. He's holy, holy, holy. He's holy cubed, holy to the power of three, superlatively holy. And this is superlatively imperfect. And John wants to show us when he says calculate the number of the beast. He's saying realize what you're doing when you're letting the state bully you into worshipping it. And when you're getting into false religion and doing things which aren't consistent with worship of Jesus. He says, you're actually embracing imperfection. You're on, you're siding with Satan. As we close, what's all this about? How does Satan wage war? What is his attack on us like? What's his plan for attacking us? Beast one, oppressive powers that be. Beast two, the deceit of false religion. That's what to look out for the government and religious establishments. That's where you'll probably come under fire. And the application's clear, isn't it? Verse 10, this calls for patient endurance and faithfulness. Be patient, be faithful. Verse 18, be wise. Discern when you're crossing the line, when there's danger of siding with false religion. Don't sell out following Jesus. Let's pray.